Welcome back, everybody, to Tanya for Life. We're now once again in chapter 11. We're talking about the, um, the Russia and what is a Russia. Because remember, we're, we're not talking about the, um, in terms of judgment, how, I mean, what we learned in the Gemara earlier was that if a person sins and he um, does Teshuva, from the moment he does Teshuva, on he is now tzaddik from the moment that he's done a sin until he does shiva he's considered a rasha so that's in terms of reward and punishment in terms of the ranking of a soul that comes down to this world um we learn that there are five different ranks and um that's the level that a person will be born into and we know that we work on it. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. Um, especially the reason that we're learning what level is a tzaddik, you know, the lowest of the lows, is so that we chas v'shalom don't take, make um, our own judgments so hard on ourselves or so hard on our, the ones that we love. Because if we at least know that this is within their spiritual DNA, then we can have a little bit more, a lot more compassion. Um, to know what to expect. So when we're talking about the Rasha, we already know not to expect perfection because a tzaddik is the level of perfection. And a Benoni is one who doesn't make mistakes um, in thought, speech, or actions. But uh, uh, a Rasha, for sure, he makes mistakes. It's part of his DNA. Um, so, however, as the Rebbe notes, we're getting back into it, um, because we, we ended last lesson with the three forms of pardon, that once a Russia, once a person sins, um, then he goes back to Hashem, comes back to his neshama, his soul, um, and does teshuva. There are three ways that he can be um, accepted, his teshuva will be accepted. Um, so we talked about that last time. The first level is pretty much um, if the prohibition, if the person sinned against a prohibition that was a mitzvah taser, right? A mitzvah that Hashem said you should do this. Um, and he, if this person says to Shiva, then he is given forgiveness at once. So now the, the sin that's caused the stain in his body, in his soul, in his um, blocking the relationship with God, what has happened after this shuva is it's completely gone. All the stains are gone. On the the second type of transgress, the second type of pardon is if he transgressed a prohibitive commandment, right? So if he did something that Hashem said don't do, then he's created a blemish in the world. He's created a blemish in his body and his soul. Remember, the prohib prohibitive commandments are related to the sinews, the gidim, 365 sinews. Um, and there's actually more of them than there are the positive commandments, which just shows you how important it is for us to exercise refrain in this world. If we're going to exist in this world, it's one of the basic tenets that we need to be able to to um, refrain. So if a person um, transgressed a, a command that, that Hashem said to refrain from something, it's not enough just for the person to repent because it's a graver, it's a deeper um, blemish. It's more, more complicated. So now he has to repent, he has to say tshuva. And then when the day of Yom Kippur comes around, that sin, that specific civic sin and the blemishes, the consequences of it that weren't already um, washed out will now be all washed out, right? So it's Teshuvah and Yom Kippur. So when it comes to the third type of pardon, the third type of way that Hashem says, okay, I accept your, your repentance and now everything's gone. This one, takes, it's a deeper process of cleansing. So if this transgression that the person did isn't um, isn't just a, an everyday minor occurrence. If it's something really, really big that Hashem said, if you do this, 
then you can you'll be liable for the um, the punishment of spiritual excision or chasasham execution at the hands of the beitin. Remember arba mitot beitin. So again, these punishments are only for the sake of cleansing the soul, only for the sake of our good. So in order to get rid of um, these serious, serious sins, chas v'shalom, like the four cardinal sins, um, like adultery, um, like murder, chas v'shalom, all those commandments that were written down um, in the Ten Commandments. So when if a person has done something like this, then they have to give a full repentance. They have to do tshuva. Then they have to go um, through the cleansing of Yom Kippur. But on top of that, they also have to go through personal suffering because personal suffering will help to, um, uh, to bring it out, take it all out. Um, so now we're up to date. However, as the Rebbe notes, the divine pardon elicited by, by this person's repentance does not change the status of Russia in the true sense of the term, but only in the borrowed sense of the terms, Russia and Sadiq is applied to reward and punishment. Indeed, when weighed on the scales of merits and sins, such a person who sins rarely, only in minor matters, and then repents immediately is deemed a Sadiq, and he deserves reward since the overwhelming majority of his deeds are good. And so this is what we were saying at the beginning just now, how um, when it comes to reward and punishment, we should really think, we should really um, sleep easy <laughs> because, um, because it's something attainable that in this regard of reward punishment, you can be considered a tzaddik, even if you sin. Um, you just need to always try to, to get better and better. You always need to try, you know, try recognize when you did something wrong and say sorry and apologize and, and um, you know, say sorry to yourself, say sorry to Hashem, say sorry for the people around you who got hurt because of what you did. Um, because our sins never just affect us. They always affect the people that we love. They always affect the people that we interact with. So we should really keep this in mind. Um, yes. So yeah, so in terms of reward and punishment, we, we talked about that. And if your ma majority of your deeds are good, um, and especially one who's done teshuva, teshuva is such a mitzvah that um, you're able to completely reverse all evil that you've done, all the sins that you transgressed, if you've done to shiver for it, it becomes like as if you never sinned and it, you go straight further, way further than you've ever gone before. So such a bracha, even to, to, to be able to make mistakes is such a bracha. So that we can always come back to Hashem. But this usage of tzaddik is merely a borrowed term, as explained in chapter one. As true definitive terms, tzaddik and rasha describe the quality of the good or evil in one's soul. Viewed in this perspective, the person described above is classified as a rasha, even after he repents and is pardoned, for he still retains his predisposition towards sin, and his animal soul still tends to dominate him. So here, um, we're not talking about, in our context, we're not talking about reward and punishment. Here in our context, we're talking about the soul level, what it is to be qualified at the soul level of Russia. Um, like last chapter, we were talking about what it means to be qualified at the level of tzaddik. So here, um, a Russia has a bodily drive. He has more drive than, um, than anyone else towards the gashmiot towards anything that's not obviously Hashem. So, um, and that means that he has more um, of a predisposition. So he's more, has a tendency, it'll be much easier for him because there's more of a, a pull towards sin for him. Um, and his animal soul tends to 
dominate him. That's what it is to be a Russia. Thus far, the Alter Rebbe has discussed a higher level Russia, the Russia who knows good, one in whom the animal soul rarely prevails, and then only in one of the three soul garments of thought, speech, and action. So the type of Russia we talked about so far is the higher level Russia. Remember, there are at least two levels, and we're dealing with the two levels. So the higher level Russia is one who knows good. So he's a Russia. Everything we just spoke about is applicable to him, that his animal soul is, you know, very strong, very desirous, and he has a predisposition to um, go towards sin. Um, but this Russia is one who falls. He, he may be really good in so many aspects of his life. Like we know many people who are so good um, and so refined and they've worked on themselves so much. Um, but still, from time to time, they have specific issues, maybe only in their thoughts, maybe sometimes with the way they interact with a certain person, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this level, this person's still a Russia, a level of Russia, but he knows good. So he, he is open to still good goodness. He doesn't completely define himself with the bad. Um, and what we're talking about now, we're going to learn about the Russia on the other level, the lower level. There is another type of Russia who knows good. Um, in whom the evil prevails more strongly. All three garments of evil clothe themselves in him. He transgresses in thought, speech, as well as in action. Also, the evil causes him to commit more heinous sins and to sin more frequently. He too is nevertheless described as a Russia who knows good, for intermittently between one sin and the next, he experiences remorse and thoughts of repentance enter his mind, arising from the aspect of good that is still in his soul, and that gathers a degree of strength in the interim. However, the good in him does not strengthen itself sufficiently to vanquish the evil, so that he can rid himself entirely of his sins and be as one who confesses his sins and abandons once and for all. Wow. Okay, so I jumped ahead a bit too far. Um, here the Alter Rebbe is telling us of another type of Russia who knows good, Russia Vatovla. Um, and this is someone who doesn't just sin within only one of the soul garments of thought, speech, or action. This is someone who can sin in all of them or, um, or someone who can sin, you know, almost every moment, almost every second, that someone can be doing something that they know is wrong. Maybe they're angry at somebody and lose their temper, and they're impatient, and they know it's wrong. They know that this is not a good midah, this is, is a transgression. Um, and they still, they still do it. Um, but as soon as they recognize it's the wrong thing, they try their best to, to stop. They, they feel regret. They feel regret that they're doing this. I can't believe that I'm losing my temper again. I can't believe that I'm doing this um, transgression. It's not good for me. It's not good for the other person. It's not good for Hashem. Hashem doesn't want this. So they try to do shuvah and they do to shuvah. Um, but then they can't help it. As soon as they've done to shuvah, they get angry again, right? And so they do to shuvah again. And then they get angry again and they do to shuvah. So this is a person, it's fine to do that. It's really good to do that, um, to keep doing to shuvah as you realize where you're at. Whenever you realize that you're doing something wrong, always do shuva as soon as you can. Um, that also helps you to separate yourself from, from what you're not, because you're not um, you're not the anger. The anger is coming from your animal soul. It's something covering you. It's not you fully. Um, so even this person who does bad things, even worse than anger, chas v'shalom, um, and he sins frequently, he still describes someone who knows good because he still um, he still feels connected with his neshama, his godly soul inside. And that's why he feels remorse because of his connection to it. So that means he does know good, even if he does a lot of bad things. However, the 
um, and the good within him is not strong enough to vanquish the evil. If there was more good in him, then he would be more easily able to stop listening to the Sahara. And that's part of like what we're doing here, what we're able to, to um, um, when we're able to access and, and use up our minds within Torah study, within mitzvot, within allowing our minds to, and prayer, within allowing our minds to um, meditate, to think about the Torah and to try to um, let it sit within us, allow it to kind of absorb within our heart, within our mind and within our heart, because that's the process of change. Um, that's where the process of change starts. So changing the animal soul, elevating the animal soul. So, um, so we can actually strengthen ourselves. And remember what we said at the beginning, Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson said, a person who is a Rasha, don't think of him as like a wicked person. Think of him as someone who never got the tools to learn how to um, fight his Yitzhahara, to know who he is and who he is not. And no one's ever really trained him to go through the process of not being perfect and um, fighting this Yitzhahara with him. So one of these things that we can do, these tools that Hashem has given us through CBTT, Miriam's um, taught us that cultivating the Chachma Bin Da'at within the mind that we've talked about many times already is one of these big, big tools because the Yitzhahara, like the, the animal soul, it lives in our heart in the, I believe, right side of our heart. So our aim is to get this holiness, this kedusha, this holy, holy, fiery kedusha of Hashem into the heart, into that chamber to, to help the animal soul to learn, to grow, to elevate and actually get what it wants because the animal soul is an animal. It wants to live, it wants security, it wants to survive, it wants to be happy. <laughs> um, so, so these are things that the animal soul wants and it's all ultimately from Hashem. We just need to teach him that's what he wants. We need to do that by meditating more, using our mental faculties to absorb information and pray to Hashem and, um, that it, it comes through into our heart to transform this animal soul here. Um, and that's a really great thing that we can do that helps us to fight this Yetahara. Instead of dragging it around and making it do what we want, we actually come to it on its own terms, um, like a baby, like we talked about many times. Um, in this process, of CBTT, we're actually mushing up the, the food to give it to the baby instead of expecting the baby, which is animal soul, to be able to digest all this holy information straight away, which he cannot. So even if a person desires to do good and he's not going through this process of mushing up the food, mushing up the goodness um, in a way that's digestible for, for this coarse being, then a person's gonna have difficulty. But if you're able to mash up this holiness and you know continue to, to give more and more to your animal soul and to the right side of your heart, then the easier time you'll have with fighting your emotions and fighting your um, Yetzahara. Yeah, and ultimately the level that we want to achieve um, is a person who confesses his sins and abandons them altogether, doesn't do them anymore. That's what we want to get to. As Rasha, you know, as the, at the soul level of Rasha, we really want to get to that level and we know we're not there yet. Most of us are not there yet. We want to stop sinning for once and for all. So concerning such a person, the rabbi of blessed memory have, the rabbis of blessed memory have said, the wicked are full of remorse. Wow. Um, the wicked are full of remorse between sins. It is also possible that even while sinning, they regret their actions, but they feel themselves unable to master their desires. They're unable to control their urges. So this is a person we were talking about just before I went on the little bit of a tangent. Um, so a person who's sinning, and while he's sinning, he he realizes that he's doing something he doesn't want to do. He's sinning and he's, he, he, um, he can't stop. He can't stop himself. 
but that regret that he feels that shows that he has good in him he's a, a, a rasha batoblo and, and i think a way to, to look at this also is to have compassion for the person that we're we're learning about through speaking these words through reading these words that there are people who regret what they're doing but they can't stop doing it they're unable to master it they're not able to hold themselves under their own desires and their own control. They're kind of, um, like we said, not driving their own vehicle. Someone else is doing it for them. And unfortunately, it's the, it's the animal soul. And so you can think, you know, I, I really encourage you to think about sometimes in your life where you know you've wanted to do something good or you've wanted to do something better and you haven't being able to show up for yourself in that way um for whatever reasons there's many excuses all the time um but in the end of the day if you're not doing something that um are in line with your beliefs um if you're doing a sin if you're hurting yourself so these are things that um that can show you the person that we're talking about in this text right now so you, if you look at how many times that you've gone through this, it can help you to have more compassion for how many times does the other person go through it? How many times have you told somebody how to be better and they didn't listen to you? I mean, it makes sense. If you're on this level of Russia, it will keep happening because they don't have control. Um, so really, these people need compassion. We need compassion. We're not on the level where we can judge ourselves like a tzaddik. So we really need the compassion to, to accept where we're at. So these represent the majority of the wicked in whose soul there still lingers some good. And this good, which causes these feelings of vexation and remorse in their mind and heart. Wow, I love that. That's so powerful. So here, when learning now, the majority of... Um, the majority of wicked people, Rasha'im, are within the level of Rasha Batoblo, people who have good within them still, who, who see good still. And, and the frustration that we feel sometimes and the remorse, like feeling, you know, guilty of what we've done, it's a good thing. And that, that, that exists in our mind and our heart. It's a good thing to, to feel remorse when we're doing something wrong. Um, and it just shows you what level of Russia, that you're on the Russia of a Tovlo. We thus see that there are many levels within the rank of Russia who knows good, ranging from one who sins only rarely, only in minor matters, and with the involvement of only one sole garment. To he who sins often, um, grievously, and with all three soul garments, yet they all come under the same heading of the Ra who knows good. The difference between them being to what degree the good within them is dominated by the evil. In direct contrast, the rank of the Tzaddik who knows evil, where there are various degrees of dominance of the evil by the good. So what, what the... Well, the explanation there is basically um, that Rasha Vatovlo can be so many people. It can be like the greatest people who are better than the majority of the world. Um, and they're, they're amazing in all aspects of their being, except for maybe from time to time, they think how high of themselves, think how good they are. So that's not a, a kosher thought um, if it's done in a haughty way. And you have a person who who sins and sins and sins and sins most of the time and they still then they feel guilty about it so those are the types of russia they're still the same category now having to find the russia who knows good the alter rebel will turn to consider the russia who knows only evil so he who never feels contrite contrition and in whose his mind, no thoughts of repentance or ever enter, is called a rasha who knows only evil. For only the evil in his soul has remained in him, having so prevailed over the good that the latter, 
has departed from within him. Wow. And the good now stands in a matter of makif over him, which means the good hovers over him, so to speak, in an aloof and external manner, so that he has no conscious awareness of it. Yet, since he still possesses good, albeit as a makif, for after all, he possesses a divine soul. Wow. Therefore, having the sages said, therefore have the sages said, one, over every gathering of any ten Jews rests the Shrina, the divine presence. That's in Sanhedrin. That is to say, even if they are all in the category of the Rasha who knows only evil, Shrina still hovers over them, for they too possess good in a manner of makif, since at such a gathering, the Shrina is present only in the externally encompassing way of makif, not entering the consciousness of those assembled. Therefore, their correspondingly makif level of good is sufficient to enable them to receive this revelation. With regard to the subject of the Jew, whose animal soul prevails over his divine soul, the following story bears mention. A certain free thinker once asked the Semach Tzedek, the word Yehudim, Jews, is normally spelt in the book of Esther, with one letter Yud before the final letter. Why is it that when the word is used, they're in connection with the harsh decree against the Jews, it is spelled with two letters, Yud. The Tanakh Tzedek answered, Yud is numerically equivalent to 10. It represents the 10 soul powers possessed by both the divine and animal souls. There are Jews who conduct their lives solely according to the dictates of the divine soul's 10 powers, while in other Jews, the animal soul's soul prevails and their conduct is dictated also by the animal soul's 10 powers. Haman planned to exterminate all the Jews, even those who were of two Yuds, which means those, even the Haman wanted to even kill the Jews who were ruled by the 10 evil soul powers as well. But the man persisted. Why then is the word spelled several times with two yuds even after the decree was repealed? To which the Tzemach Tzedek responded, after suffering under Haman's evil decree and ultimately witnessing God's salvation, even those Jews repented and became equals of their brethren whose lives were led by the dictates of the divine soul and good inclination. Thus concluded the Tzemach Tzedek, the two yuds, the yud or yid, which is also yud for Jew, became equal. Wow. Nobody is better than anyone else. Okay, so here, the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe is telling us that um, the level of a Rasha who knows only evil, his, the goodness within him has been so, um, it's not even palpable. The person can't even feel the good within him. He doesn't like define himself by his godly soul, by his godly desires. He defines himself by the animal soul, by what the animal soul desires, by all the, the, the um, worldly concerns, right? And unfortunately what happens is this person, his, his godly soul has been kind of kicked out the, the the kedusha has kind of been kicked out of his body that through his his doing all this all the time not doing teshuva he he's not bringing his soul back so it kind of gets pushed out uh, it seems around the body a makif is is not something inside like panimi it's something outside the external so so the goodness within him kind of sits on the outside and this is what it is for tzaddikim, for not tzaddikim, for rasha'im, for like the lowest level. It's kind of like the same way um, the impurity we learned in the other chapters of how klipa receives from Hashem. It receives in a way that it's not, um, Hashem's kedusha doesn't come into klipa to give it life, to sustain it, um, because it's so, it's so the opposite of Hashem. It's so um unrefined and coarse and um lowly so the way that Hashem gives sustenance to it is kind of like like to the Rasha here 
that it, it's on the makif, it's external. It doesn't go inside, it, it's here on the outside. So this is what a, what a Russia, the um, Russia who only knows evil, Russia Viralo. Um, and, and Miriam, Miriam tells us that um, th these people, people who are on this level, of course, like the Rosh Avatovlo, they can range from different, in different um, character traits um, and experiences. But, but ultimately, it's all about um, the godly soul and the animal soul, which one has more dominance and which one has less. So uh, one who is whose soul, the Rasha Baralo, whose soul is so, he's, he's so dominated by his animal soul that his godly soul is pushed out of him. Um, this person can be people who never feel regret. They don't feel regret. They don't even see what they do wrong. Um, and they never think about apologizing because they don't feel like they did anything wrong. You can meet many people like this. Um, so it's good to know that these people exist. Um, so we don't waste our time. Um, but also within this category in a deeper, more dark place can be chasushalam, people more psychotic or psychotic, but um, uh, like, like um, narcissistic uh, people who enjoy hurting others, chas v'shalom, chas v'chalila, because of course, this is not a godly attribute. So the soul has been kind of kicked out of the body, kicked out of the of the domain, so to speak. Um, and if you remember in, I think, chapter 10, um, the fight between the two kings. So within the Rasha Viralo, the, the one king has kind of won it all. He's won complete dominance over the entire body, over the mind, over the all the organs and all the functions of the entire person. Um, like it's really something we need to pray for, for these people, um, whoever they are, even if it's us, sometimes but, but um, really people need so much help. People need so much help. And I like this, that in the end, no matter what level you're on, you can always do Tshuva. Even this level. <coughs> um, so that when it came to um, the Book of Esther, for example, way, way back, hundreds of years ago, when um, Esther was going through that process of becoming queen and Haman was trying to kill all the Bnei Israel, um, that there were Jews who were like Tzadikim, Jews who were run by their godly soul, and there were Jews who were run by their animal soul um, more. And both these Jews, in the end, Came, were able to, to still exist together and still become equal because they were able, they were, they did to shiver in the end. They saw how, like what matters in the end. And that's all often, <coughs> I mean, some people call it a rock bottom, but it's like a wake up call. Shem gives us many opportunities, no matter who we are. We have many opportunities to wake up from our, um, our mind frame, the way that we see things, our perspective, to wake up from, you know, how we're dealing with life. Um, what are we, how are we growing? What are we doing for our neshama? Um, so we have many opportunities to, to use our sufferings of, within the world or chasvisham or whatever it is to wake up and say, oh, this is not okay. My life doesn't, doesn't need to keep going in this direction and it's a waste. I don't want to keep going this direction. I want to do teshuva. I want to come back to Hashem. I want to keep striving for Hashem no matter how many times I fall. I want to just keep getting up and getting up and getting up and getting up and just keep going forward and forward and forward um, because I am still a Yid. I'm still Jew. I'm still beloved by Hashem. Hashem created me as I am, um, which means that he loves me as I am. I want to love him also so i want to come closer and closer and baruch hashem we all have we have the capacity to get to the higher level even at Saudi, uh, a russia on this lowest level russia who only sees bad he does have the capability the ability to elevate himself onto the higher level so that he does start feeling remorse um 
And Bezor Hashem, that's, that's what we want to be doing, to keep getting to the next higher level, the next um, level of Avodah Hashem. So with that, we finished chapter, um, chapter 11? No, no, chapter 12, I think. Chapter 11. So let us do a meditation and then we'll finish here. So I welcome everyone to close your eyes, allow yourself to be present within your body, to feel what might be happening inside, where you feel a bit of tension, maybe you feel a bit uncomfortable in your back, in your neck, Maybe in your legs, wherever you feel anything, just acknowledge it, recognize it, and allow it to keep moving. Moving your awareness up into your mind, to your brain, wherever you can feel any sort of tension. Maybe your mind's been racing or overwhelmed. feeling stuck maybe in some places. Maybe there's some painful memories that you don't really want to deal with. Maybe it's a whole list of things to do. So you feel a bit restless, whatever it is, just acknowledge it, recognize it sitting there in your brain. And give it space to exist and allow it to keep moving through. So bring your awareness back into your body, your hands, squeeze your hands and imagine all the tension and all your arms getting squeezed in your fists, breathing in and out, letting go. Feel what it feels like to release. Feel the absence of the tension. Feels lovely. Do it again. Tensing up, imagine anything, any muscle tension, any experiences your hands have gone through today or how long you've been living, <laughs> whatever difficulties your hands have experienced in their lifetime. Maybe sins, whatever transgressions have been acted out through these fists. and recognizing and letting go, allowing it to keep moving through. Feel Hashem's presence swarming in into these hands, these arms. Moving down your awareness into your toes and all your legs, like crunch your toes, and your feet, curl them up, tense. You can tense up your calves, bum, your thighs. So just feel the tense contraction. And let go. Feel what it feels like to let go to relax. One more time, tense it all up, curl your toes, squeeze your feet, your thighs, your calves, your bum. Imagine whatever muscle memory, emotional memory, mental memories reside, have associations with this part of your body, your lower body. Whatever transgressions may have 
then act it out through this part of you. Allow it to let go. Breathing out. Now feel it all relaxed. In its presence, feel Hashem swarming in like a beautiful, beautiful, fresh breeze. Filling you up with peace and tranquility and Kedusha. Moving up with your awareness to your pelvic floor, your abdominals, maybe even your back, your lower middle back. Just tense all of this. And let go. Feel the absence of attention. Allowing your breath to spread through gently. One more time, let's tense up. Your pelvis, your abdominals, your back, all your organs. Imagine everything getting condensed, contracted. As you think of any memories, any experiences that you've had in this these areas of your body that maybe Chas Shalom have been part of transgression. Now, recognize it, acknowledge it, and allow it to let go as you breathe out. Feel yourself relax as the tension leaves and you feel more and more of his presence entering you like a warm bubbling light like joy it feels like joy what else does it feel like fun this fun happy bubbly energy entering you with tranquility with kedusha it's Hashem's presence Forgiveness, security. Moving up to your chest. Imagine the tension within your animal soul. The right side of your heart. Imagine the left side of your heart where your godly soul resides. Imagine your upper back and your neck and your shoulders. Bring your shoulders up. So tense all of this area and let go. Allowing yourself to feel the absence of contraction. Do it once more. Up or contract it in your heart. Imagine all transgressions, chasushalma memories that have been experienced through these parts of your parts of your being. And let go. As you imagine this light, this holy Kedusha coming into you, this presence of Hashem swelling around your God soul, your animal soul in your heart, swelling around all these parts of you. And imagine as your Yetzirah, your animal soul gets transformed, encased in this beautiful light, Swelling and swelling and swelling. And imagine this purification like a diamond getting cleaned, polished to be able to shine brightly. And then moving up to your, your face muscles. So however you can contract them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just contract all your face muscle, facial muscles around your eyes, around your jaw, your cheeks. Imagine whatever tensions, memories, emotions, experiences, transgressions have been 
used through your mouth, through your sight, through your ears, your hearing, and through your thinking, your head. Imagine all of this tensed up. Let go. Do it one more time. And let go. Feel yourself open up like there's more space, like there's more kudusha, like there's more presence of Hashem within you, within all of these parts of you. And feel this energy of Hashem entering, rushing, swelling and swelling, cleansing and refining and becoming one with you. And imagine this golden, pure light working behind your eyes, through your eyes and radiating, shining outwards. There's spiritual light so you can see with Hashem's eyes. Imagine this light bubbling, turning, swirling, purifying your mouth so that you can speak Hashem's words with kind, loving words. Words that bring unity. Imagine your ears, the same beautiful light bubbling forth and shining through so that you can hear Kadusha, so that you can interpret with holiness. And in your mind, Hashem swirling, Hashem's presence swirling around and cleaning and purifying your mind so that you can go through this pruning, neuro pure pruning process. We get rid of all the associations that kept you in the hold of and instead you can be filled with the Kedusha, the Kedusha mindset, Kedusha thought processes. So with this beautiful picture of yourself just radiating from within, this holy Kedusha of Hashem, that's being shined upon the world through you. Allow this image to sink in. in meditations of mind and heart. Stay ingrained within us. So that it'll be easier and easier to be refined and it'll be easier and easier to be holy, reach the next high level. And that's it for today. Thank you for joining us.